over 40 years in an arid landlocked country in the heart of Southern Africa, a quiet economic and social miracle has been taking place. Despite the ethnic and economic turmoil that surrounds it, Botswana has risen to become the star of Africa. Around the world for a thousand years, that most valued gemstone, the diamond, has adorned the bodies of the rich and famous. These sparkling stones have transformed Botswana from one of the poorest countries in the world to, so far, one of the most prosperous and stable countries in Africa. Um, these ones are fancy. Yeah, the more they get cut, they get polished. Sometimes they lose their greenness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the white ones will always remain the white ones. Kamotso and Petle says her life has also been transformed. I am what I am because of the diamonds. Whoever out there is whoever they are there because of the diamonds. The schools, the infrastructure, the whole development that you see is strict uh, because of the diamonds. When in 1966 Botswana gained independence from Britain, the nation's best kept secret was made public. The country had diamonds and lots of them. At independence, the capital Habarone was a remote cattle station on the edge of the Kalahari Desert. Now, thanks to revenue from the mines, it is a thriving modern city. It's how Botswana manages its wealth that singles out this tiny African nation from some of its other resource-rich near neighbours. Good governance. A government that is not looking at enriching itself, a government that is not looking at using diamonds to fight within and outside, a diamond that used, I mean, a, a government that used diamonds to bring about health facilities, education, and, and uh, a, market, a markedly improved um, quality of life. Unlike other African countries where the discovery of diamonds has turned into a curse with the so-called blood or conflict diamonds fueling exploitation, subversion and division, in Botswana, the nation's geological wealth, worth about three billion US dollars a year, has been shared. In Botswana, the legislation is such that all mineral rights are actually vested in the Republic of Botswana. They don't belong to a tribe or to a community. They belong to the country. But 50% of the diamonds go to the giant of the diamond business, De Beers. The Republic of Botswana and De Beers formed a company, Debswana, to mine and market the diamonds to the world. Well, if you go back to the level of our sophistication at the time when we went into partnership with them, you will realize they did a lot for us. Because at the time we really didn't know where to begin, what to do, and we really needed somebody like that to hold our hand and walk us through. And Tetling Masisi says it was a business partnership born out of necessity. The earnings from our exports of diamonds have really done a lot for us. Agriculture used to be our mainstay and it used to bring us uh, the, the revenue for government. But once the diamonds came in, there was a marked difference, a very big difference. Komotso and Petle started working at the diamond trading company of Botswana straight from high school. She now sorts and grades the precious stones. Young as I was, I think I had the passion for learning more about diamonds. Um, as you know, I think most Botswana are not exposed to diamonds. Um, they hear about them, they haven't seen them, most of them. So for me, it was an opportunity to actually come and touch them and work with them and feel what they're like. As a child, Mpetle grew up in a poor rural community, but her country was transforming and so were her ambitions. It has always been my dream that I own 
my home, I had even set a time frame for it. I had said before I reached the age of 35, I should have my own home that I know I'm paying the mortgage and I'm comfortably set. She reached that goal ahead of schedule and now at 34, she's one of Botswana's growing middle class. And this is the source of Mpetle's and Botswana's wealth, Arapa, the resting place of lions on the northern edge of the Kalahari Desert. This is the mine that was built in this country. All the resources, the money that has come out of, has been invested in building this country. Since mining began here in 1971, more than 336 million tonnes of soil has been pulled out of this pit, along with 272 million carats of diamonds. Although the global economic crisis saw job cuts last year and the mine suspended operations for a number of weeks as demand worldwide slowed down, they say there are enough diamonds here to keep miners busy for decades to come. It is gonna get bigger. Since 1971, we have mined two parts. We are on, on part number two, and we will be going to a third part, which will start possibly in the next five or six years from now. In terms of your, you know, if your plan, because you've got your... Mine manager Matomi Malema says unlike most companies that exploited Africa's resources and like many who continue to this day, De Beers did not simply plunder. Uh, one would uh, uh, probably reflect back you know, and say that uh, if you look at uh, you know, uh, major, some of the major mining companies in the world, you know, their relationship with governments you know, you know, across the world you know, has not been uh, 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 um, you know, the best that they could be. But in the case of Debsana, you know, you've got this 40-41 uh, year relationship that has you know, uh, moved from strength to strength you know, over the years. This clinic has gone from very humble beginnings to a fully-fledged hospital with money from the mine. But it's not just for the mine workers. The entire community has access to the facilities. Dr. Mwamba Nesibula has worked here for almost a decade. It was a house, a, a one-roomed house, like a first aid station, together with the exploration. As the mine was set up, it became two rooms. And then with that, now we just added on more buildings. Now we, have, we are at a stage where we have a, a high care unit, a research station room, we have a theater, and we have the several wards uh, to accommodate inpatients. Dr. Nesabula says the company cares for two reasons. One is a selfish reason that we want our workforce to remain productive for as long as possible, but also because the company cares and would like to, to demonstrate that caring attitude by partnering with the government and providing a service to the community. Botswana made an early decision to grow its own workforce, with Diamond Revenues funding education abroad. Mine General Manager Matomi Malema owes both his education and his career to Diamonds and Debswana. When I finished you know, high school, I actually got a scholarship from Debswana. So Debswana basically trained me you know, uh, to become a metallurgical engineer that I am, you know, uh, at, at, at the moment. And then uh, I came back to uh, Debsona and, you know, worked, you know, uh, uh, my way, you know, up the ranks. So it's a typical uh, story of a, you know, uh, um, of a rural boy, you know, uh, moving from a rural boy to a general manager of one of the largest mines in the world. It's pretty good going. Very much so. But for a country that prides itself on being the world's largest diamond producer, there is one hurdle it is yet to overcome. And that's being able to sell the diamonds it produces at home for jewellery to be made locally. De Beers has long controlled the sale of diamonds on a global scale. Now it's being pushed to give more back to Botswana. So it's time to value add? Yes. It's time to value add, but then you don't, you don't, um, 
do it in a manner that will, will uh, destroy partnerships like those. Because you, you, you still do need them because diamonds are, are a very delicate product to market. And so you don't, you don't scorn your, your partners when you think you, you, you are there. Botswana's wealth has a cost. Now almost totally reliant on money from diamonds, the country's welfare and future is now in the hands of the diamond traders and at the whims of the international market. But for Komotso and Petle, spending time in one of the growing number of shopping malls that cater for Botswana's new middle class, the possibilities appear endless. I think there are so many opportunities that are still coming. So I want to put myself in a, in, a, in a level that I'll be able to achieve what I'm dreaming of achieving. So like in South Africa, you know, there are women who are in the mining industry, there are women who are running the show. So I think I want to be one of those. That's my dream. Mm -hmm.